So today we celebrate the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother. This dogma of the Immaculate Conception, of course, poses ecumenical difficulties. For our Protestant Christians find it difficult to accept this dogma simply because they think that it is against Scripture. For if you read the first letter of John in chapter 1, St. John makes it clear, all of us have sinned, and he who says he has no sin is a liar. And so, in the understanding of Protestant Christians, all of us, therefore, are sinners. No one is exempted from sin. And so, how could it be that for Mary? And so, it's important for us, therefore, to try to understand the dogma of Immaculate Conception and how this dogma is consistent with the Scripture and certainly part of our faith. And not only that, but it is also, to a great extent, in line with the Protestant doctrine of salvation by grace alone. So in the first place, we need to really reiterate that the Scripture has spoken of the fact that all of us, we need salvation by Christ, including Mary, of course. Because in the letter of St. Paul to Corinthians, in chapter 15, St. Paul passed on the message that Christ died for our sins. So if Christ died for our sins and wants salvation for us, it is indeed that we need to make Jesus really our Saviour. And in this case, also that of Mary. And furthermore, we are clear that Jesus, certainly, He died for our sins and atonement is made for us all. In today's letter of St. Paul to Ephesians, we are told that all these have been chosen for us in Christ. And so, when we reflect on the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, Therefore, we need to, right from the outset, make it clear that Mary required salvation. And this salvation, the church in the dogma of the Black Conception made it clear as well that Mary was saved by the grace of Christ, by the foreseen merits of Jesus' death on the cross. And so, the difference between Mary's uh, salvation and ours was that Mary was saved at the moment of her conception before the coming of Christ. And of course, we know, as in the letter of St. Paul to Ephesians, all these things have already been foreseen by God. Christ is the eternal Word of the Father. And so in view of His incarnation, His passion, death and resurrection, Mary, therefore, was saved by the merits of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, by exemption. And so it is not true, therefore, to say that Mary was not saved by Christ. He was saved by anticipation. And that is only the first point when we speak about Mary's redemption by Christ. But it is also equally important to, again, not to realign, but to reiterate that the Protestant doctrine of salvation by grace alone is also our doctrine. We are not, therefore, saying that salvation is through good works. It is really by grace alone. In fact, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception uh, brings the doctrine of salvation by grace alone to its perfection. What do we mean? In the first place, for God to choose Mary to be the mother of God is itself a gift. Mary does not deserve to be the mother of God. That is pure grace. And for Mary to be exempted from sin, that is even pure grace. The church is not saying, therefore, that Mary should be exempted, must be exempted 
because she is the mother of Jesus. The doctrine of the church makes it clear it was fitting that Mary was exempted from the stain of original sin. Fitting, appropriate, on hindsight, on reflection. It was not an absolute necessity, but it is fitting for Mary, who is called to be the mother of the Saviour, that she should be preserved from sin. And that is pure grace again. It is pure grace. And this understanding of pure grace should not be something that surprises us because the whole history of salvation is pure grace. So why should we grudge Mary of this grace to be immaculately conceived or be the mother of the Saviour? Because all elections of God is pure grace. When God chose Abraham, it's pure grace. God chose the kings, God chose the prophets, the judges, they are pure grace. God chose even the apostles. When we read the St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says, who were you? You were nobody. You were poor. But God has chosen you in order to underscore that salvation is not because of our human efforts or because we are good enough, but the pure grace of God. So, in truth, all of us, including Mary, we know that who we are today, it is really the grace of God. There is nothing to boast about. And I think the real challenge for us today is to consider, as we celebrate the Feast of the American Conception, that are we really like Mary, a docile to the grace of God. Do we believe that our salvation is pure grace? The real challenge in the world today is not that people today believe in grace. People believe today only through efforts, hard work. In fact, today the first reading from the book of Genesis, our first parents fell into sin. And you notice that the reason why they fell into sin was because they were tempted by their pride and therefore leading to disobedience. And the real danger of the world today is that we think that we can do it all by ourselves. We do not even accept the fact that we are sinners, we are weak. That is the real sin of the world, to think that we have no sin. That's why I have said before, and I said again, this is a real irony. In 169 years ago, when the church declared Mary to be immaculate conceived, a lot of Protestant Christians, they were not happy because they said, how could Mary be without sin? But today, everyone says he has no sin, and that is the real irony. Today, nobody says he has no sin. The world says there is no such thing as sin. So, Today, everybody says he is immaculately conceived. And precisely, that was the case of our first parents. When they committed sin, they refused to admit that they were sinners. God asked, who told you you were naked? Have you been eating of the fruit, the tree? I forbid you to eat. And the man said, you know, it's not me. You know, it's that woman who gave me the fruit. Then the woman said, it's not me, it's because the serpent. So nobody sins. We are trying to avoid admitting that we are sinners. We are too proud. And so it's very important when we celebrate the solemnity of the Macri conception, we need to go back to the crux of the problem. What is it? That we are really saved by the grace of God. And this is brought out very beautifully in the letter of St. Paul to Ephesians, look at what he said. We have been chosen before the world was made. He chose us. He chose us in Christ. If we have been chosen right from the beginning, even before the world was made, could not God choose Mary as well? It's all within the divine providence of God. And before the world was made, God chose us, chosen in Christ to be holy and spotless. We have been chosen. That is a grace. That is a gift. And we have been chosen to become His adopted sons. Again, that is grace. Who are we to be adopted sons and daughters of God? To be His beloved. It is grace. And we are chosen to be God's own from the beginning. 
Surely this can be applied to Mary from the beginning. Of course, it is not enough to say that we have received the grace of God. The grace of God also requires our cooperation. It does not mean to say, therefore, uh, when we are chosen by grace, so we do nothing. Uh, that is the extreme form, which is not what the church is teaching about salvation by grace. It doesn't mean to say salvation by grace. We do nothing. Yes, we do something. With the grace that you have received, now you must do something. First, you must receive the grace, then you can do. Without the grace of God, you cannot do. That is why even for us Catholics, when we say that we have done some good, we have nothing to boast about. Because if God has not given us the capacity, the grace to do good, you cannot claim this credit. It's just like if God has never given you good health, you cannot do your work properly. If God has not given good health, you cannot study properly. God must first give you. Of course, you have to cooperate. You have to, as what today in the second reading again, St. Paul says, we are called to live through love in His presence. So even when we do good, it is because He has first made it possible for us to do it. So that's why that is also grace. But we have also, in that sense, contributed. So if you look at the case of Mary, the angel said, Mary had won God's favour, not because she was perfect. God has graced her with the male conception, and she has cooperated with the grace of God in her life. In that sense, she was pure and spotless. She was not pure and spotless only at birth, but throughout her life, because she continued to live out the grace that she had been given. But what about us? That grace has been given actually at baptism. But uh, immediately after baptism, we went down to the car park, we already started fighting with people. That grace was lost almost within a few minutes. So we need to therefore work uh, with the grace that we have received so that we too will really be the glory of His grace. Now, so it is not enough just to believe in the Maclean conception, that we too will be also the glory of His grace, that we too, when people look at us, they too will see us as really graced by God. And when they look at our lives, they don't just praise us. Rather, they look at our life and say, this person must have really been graced by God. Otherwise, he or she cannot be what he or she is today. That is the greatest glory of the grace of God.